Are you moving and worried about your furniture getting damaged while doing it? Don't despair. LM Removals is here for you. At LM Removals, we assist you with the move, whether you're an individual or a corporate entity. We know the stress of moving and we are here to assist you with office furniture removals, household removals, or storage facilities. We are the most reliable and efficient furniture removal services company. We deliver on time, professionally, and with zero damages. For a quotation, get in touch now. LM, make the best move. Matt G, the ghost lady, and Len Moleko. Hinda, what do you mean? What's up, boy? Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to it. I got a special guest in the evening tonight. Um, Jish, how long have I been wanting you on the show, bro? I think about a year. Ne? Yeah. And I'm feeling kind of special today because I know you hardly ever do interviews, bro. Yeah, I don't. Um... Even when you asked me, I was like, ah, because it's Mac, I'll do it. I'm only doing it because it's you, to be quite honest. If it was anybody else, I would have said no, thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And for the first time in a very long time, Len's joining us. What up, Len? What up, Len? How's it going? Yeah. How did you meet uh, Caesar, bro? Um, Why? YFM. At YFM, yeah. He used to read on our show. He used to read on, on your show, yeah. yeah. Oh, okay, cool. But anyway, uh, we'll get into all of that. Um, reason why I had you here, right? Uh, there's a lot that's happening in the country. Yeah. And, you know, I know you're very opinionated, yeah, uh, very knowledgeable with these kind of things. So I just wanted to hear your type, of, uh, your kind of view and, you know, what you think about things right now. Ah, so everybody gets invited. You ask me about girls. You ask me about <laughs> <laughs> parties. <laughs> I mean, are you going to call me and ask you about <laughs> xenophobia and femicide? <laughs> Timing. You know what? I'm actually going to go. Uh, I forgot I had another appointment. <laughs> You know, because I actually dropped your text today. I was like, listen, I've been wanting to interview, but I feel, I feel like this is the right time, you mm. know, because we need some clarity and, you know, we need to know. So here's the thing. There's a lot going on. You are correct. Um, I don't even know where we'll start. But generally, the kind of person that I am, I've always been curious. Yeah. And I think my curiosity led me to try and consume as much info as I can. Yeah. Um, which then helped me, I guess, in my later years, because I realized, it's, oh, that information is useful. Yeah. So maybe let's start off with the gender issue, right? I think, as men, in general, we tend to get defensive when this subject is brought up. Yeah. So the first thing is people equate um, violence with force. It doesn't necessarily have to be that, right? So... Maybe if I was to define it uh, very loosely, violence is any kind of violation, right? So if you've got your personal space and somebody violates that personal space, that's violence. Yeah. If you felt like being alone and somebody comes and wants to speak to you, that's violence, right? Anything that basically you wouldn't consent to. Yeah. Um, and so when you look at it that way, it then becomes pretty apparent, I think, that every man in the world is guilty in some way, shape, or form of violence against women, right? Even when you're in a relationship, for example, if you emotionally abuse somebody, that's a form of violence. It doesn't have to always be physical. Exactly. And then what guys tend to say and do is they go, ah, but I mean, that's the world as a whole. Uh, women emotionally abuse us too. Yeah. Okay, fine. Let me concede to that just for the sake of the argument and say that's true, fine. Let's say, let's say that happens. But because the world is patriarchal, right? how a woman receives the same kind of treatment that you as a man receive it is very different, right? Just in terms of waiting, mm. it weighs so much more on a woman than it would on a man. Yeah. Uh, and I can only speak for the guys. I can't speak for the women. I've never been a woman. Uh, I just think the first thing is understanding that. The first thing in most things is always knowledge of self. So you've got to know yourself and understand how you fit into the structure and the problem and the system. And then how you relate to others within that system. Yeah. So I think that's that's the beginning of the gender issue. That's the beginning of the discussion. 
I've been hearing a lot of people trying to decipher where it stems from, where it started. Where do you think it started? Um, I don't know. I've thought about that. For example, I always think, what would cause somebody to go out there and rape a woman or kill a woman, right? And there's, do- there's obviously like power dynamics at play. Um, and I don't really know about the origin, but the world in itself is structured in such a way that there is a hierarchy. Yeah. Right? Whether we like it or not. Yes. And that can be race. That can be gender. That can be class. Yeah. Yeah. Anything. Yeah. And so when you look at somebody and you go, that person is different to me, I think deep down from that difference, what you then draw is some kind of comparison. So you go, okay, if Mac G is different than me, I may not say it, but my subtle undertones will start comparing. If he's different, who's better between me and Mac G, mm. right? Uh, and then that will those microaggressions will then manifest in different ways. Yeah, yeah. So if I, I think, for example, you less than me, I'll treat you in a way that I wouldn't want to be treated. I'm glad you brought up class because the stats show that like 110 women get raped each and every day. Yeah, right. But there seems to be an outcry when class comes to play. I mean, the last time we had an outcry like this was with Garabo, you know. Um, do you think that's a factor? Definitely Classic. a factor. There's a lot of things, man. And I'm not even the best person to speak to you about this, to be quite honest, right? You probably should actually speak to a subject matter expert. But since you did ask, uh, I do think there's a lot of issues that come into play. Um, you know, the world is so unfair, Mac, Yeah. that... Even colorism comes into play. Hmm. Like, for example, if you find out somebody got murdered, we were having this discussion on Twitter just the other day, and somebody was saying, well, I'm not a yellow bone, yeah. right? Mm. The outrage wouldn't be as, uh, as loud for me, for example, as it was for a carabo, mm. you know? Mm. And so these are all things that I think we need to consider as human beings because every human being is conflicted. Yeah. There's no such thing as a perfect, perfect person. Yeah. Uh, and so, yeah, all those things come together into one big melting pot. And sometimes when things hit the fan, um, that's when you, that's like the stress test of humanity. You know, when things are going well, you never really know what the, what the underlying issues are. Yeah. It's when things are going badly where you realize, it's a chance. Is that bad? Mm. Mm. And I, what I, do you think? L- let me just let me just come in there. Sorry to 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 butt in. Yeah. You spoke about hierarchy, right? It's always been there. Uh, classism. It's always been there. So. In essence, does this mean that going forward, is this what we can expect 20, 100, 200 years from now? Because the classism and the hierarchy with men being the superior being as the world perceives it, going forward, it doesn't seem like it's changing. Yes, there is somewhat of we're trying to push the structures a little bit right now, but the push is not enough. Yeah, I can't tell you what's going to be in the future, right? I will say this, though. From what I've seen and based on history, there will always be some sort of conflict in the world. Mm. Now, it may not be a gender conflict, right? We may get equal rights for women. But then class, else, yeah, yeah. class maybe will be the next war. Mm. Um, you know, if you look at the gap between those who have and those who don't, it keeps widening. At some point, that's going to be a matter to fight over. And I don't care what anybody says. And it should be, in fact. I think it's happening right now. Yeah. The reason why people fight is for survival, right? Um, And then, obviously, there's always that one person that takes it to the extreme. And it just takes one person. Yeah. And then the ideology then permeates. Some people always go, why is it that, for example, it's always white people, even in history, who go and perpetrate violence? Right, they'll leave their native lands and come conquer others, and there's various theories. Uh, but I think one plausible one is that literally, as Africans, as the people who live, I'll just speak for Africa alone, I won't speak about all the other islands, the Caribbean, etc., and so on. Right, I won't speak about India, but there's a warmer climate there. If it was just us alone as Africans, we could live here perpetually, right? The resources are ample. There's really nothing much that we need from anybody else. 
those guys, they've got freezing winters. Yeah. <laughs> and they had to come out here <laughs> because, yo, it's tough. When people started sailing around the world, <laughs> it wasn't because of anything. It's because they were dying. Right? So they're like, yo, man, go find us something else. Bring food. You know? So that's where the survival and comes in. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. that's, and that's how colonialism then comes about. Uh, and then, you know, all sorts of evils that we can trace back to just that kind of idea, which may have started off as a noble idea of trying to save people. And then you get there and you're like, I've discovered South Africa. Where? I've discovered America. Where? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So I don't know what's going to happen 200 years from now, but I'm willing to bet my bottom dollar that there will be a conflict. Where do you think the looting comes from? So even that, right? We've got to be careful about how we phrase things, right? Uh, I'm not saying there isn't looting. Of course there is. There's things such as opportunistic crimes. So if I was already hungry, and then some sort of chaos ensues, which I suppose you can relate to, like you can call it a minor form of anarchy. And I'm like, guys, now there's an opportunity for me to go out there and get the food I've always needed. Why? What would stop me? Yeah, Even if it's for one day. Yeah. The big issue, I suppose, is always inequality. If you got rid of inequality, you'd get rid of a lot of problems in South Africa. Yeah. Not all of them, because then other problems manifest as a result of you trying to solve one problem. But you would get rid of a lot of problems. So how do you think we got here as a country? Whew. It's a lot of things. Apartheid, definitely. That's a bedrock and foundation of all our issues. Uh, then, okay, fine. Some people will say, let's move on from that. We can't really move on from it, but okay. Post-apartheid, post-colonialism, I suppose, the issue is the leadership. And if you just want to take it from the 90s onwards, the people that got into power weren't ready to lead the country. They are ready to lead us to a revolution and like lead us to being liberated. That's what they were good at. Mm. But they weren't ready to govern. Those guys have spent literally all their years in jail. What do they know about leadership? And you realize it now in hindsight because of the kind of deals that they struck. They thought they were doing what was best for the country at the time. We can't blame them. In fact, we have got nothing but to be thankful, right? Mm. But our duty now as a newer and younger generation is to take the fight forward. Yeah. They did their best and they left it somewhere. Then we need to take it forward. In fact, the I did an interview. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I did an interview with Mama Winnie Mandela a few years ago, and that's exactly what she said. She said, "Guys, we have lost uh, that vigor and the strength. You, the young people, now need to come with a new energy." So we here mostly because I'd say lack of education. But again, you've got to understand the context. When those guys took over. The country was literally broke. Uh, and they did their best, I suppose, with what they had. So, yeah. What do you think about um, President Cyril Ramaphosa's tenure so far? It's shambles. And for me, the most disappointing thing is that it's largely Juju's own doing. So, I always ask myself, even when he was running for president why he'd want to do it, right? And we were still at 702 at the time, and people called in and said, look, man, guys, this guy was always destined for it. Nelson Mandela wanted him to be the president. That's common knowledge. Um, And so I suppose he feels like that's unfinished business on his part. And that's great. I will say this. From what I've observed, I think he means well. I really genuinely think that guy wants to change the country and change the world. So that's at least a good thing, right? Another good thing is the fact that he actually is a billionaire. Mm -hmm. He's got skin in the game. He's invested, right? He doesn't want to see the country go to shit. Because, hey, man, that would be bad for him. It's bad for business. Yeah. And then obviously it would be bad for us as well. But how things have played out, sometimes just because you want something doesn't mean you're in the best position to get that thing. Mm -hmm. And I personally think that had Cyril become president back when you were supposed to be president, uh, which was mid-90s, he would have had a better tenure than what he's having now. Yeah, But don't you think with regards to him, uh, you just mentioned he's a billionaire, right? Him wearing multiple hats, uh, 
billionaire slash politician. There's somewhat of a clash there because when you look at city of Joburg, politically, Herman Mashaba, one can argue that he's very disabled, but when it comes to the running of the city from a business point of view, he's doing a very good job. Mm -hmm. Isn't that the same ailment that you would say that Cyril is going through? I mean, it doesn't have to be an impediment. I think you can wear multiple hats and do it well. But I do think the issue is you've got to understand your constituency, right? And there's no such thing as a person who knows all. So you surround yourself with people who then make up for the shortcomings that you have. For me... Which what makes I've, a good leader. Exactly. What I found surprising is... I mean, Cyril wasn't born a billionaire. Cyril's still got a sister who lives in Shawela, Right? So he can't be too far removed from the problems of the general South African to a point where he doesn't understand them. So that's very surprising to me. Um, and, you know, every time an era calls for a different style of leadership. So the way Tawambegi led, for example, may have been right for that era. But you can't now come back and emulate that style and think that's going to work in this era. Simply put, you probably need a president right now who will lead for those who don't have more than those who do have, right? So that's what I think we currently need. I don't need the government for anything. In fact, I need a leader who's going to lead against people like me, right? Uh, and make sure that those who don't have end up having better lives. So I think that's what's needed. Would Julius be that person? Julius speaks the right game. But intrinsically, I do not think that Julius is that person. You have to know him personally, I suppose, to know what I mean, right? Uh, at the end of the day, these are all people, yeah, right? Some do this because it's a job. Others do this because it's a calling. Others do it just because they can. Julius is by far the most astute politician we have in the country. But he's still a guy. Yeah. You know? Would he do a better job? I don't know. He hasn't been tested. But when it comes to a political sphere, he plays the game really well. Hmm. So you wake up tomorrow, you're the president of our republic. Top five things that are immediate attention. Me? Yeah. I go to IMF, borrow money, right? Then concentrate on education as the number one priority. Um, the problem that we're faced with now is that our literacy rate is so low that even the kind of teachers that we're churning out because they come from the system are not good teachers. So I'd go out and get them from Cuba. We've got plenty well-educated uh, Zimbabweans, for example. Yeah, I was about to say, yeah. yeah. Bring all of those people here and fix education first, right? Now, so that's the first thing. Healthcare is another, yeah. Before we get to the edu uh, to the healthcare, yeah. on, on the education part, right? Um, the school that you went to, or the schools that your peers went to, mm -hmm. do you feel that they got a better, I suppose, like education more than what the kids now are getting? And between then and now, what do you think went wrong? Well, it's difficult to say because I don't know what the kids now are getting, right? I've got nieces though, and. So I was helping my niece with her maths homework, right? And while I was helping her out, for me, the one thing that became apparent is that her teacher just didn't explain this thing well. Hmm. But that's anecdotal evidence. I can't now say all schools in South Africa are whack because of that. Maybe they just happen to have a bad teacher this year. That's it, you know? But and we have iPhones. Why do you need a maths teacher? Well, sometimes it's also just about attitude. When you give somebody a tool, but they don't have a basic understanding of how to use a tool and what they need the tool for to begin with, it doesn't help. Got you. Uh, and, you know, Len, there are some schools in rural areas, for example, that do extremely well. I, I started school, like, really early. I was, like, three. And the reason why that happened is because my mom was a teacher in Bumbul. And she used to teach at Toby High. Rural school. I'm talking long drops, pit latrines, everything, right? And she just started taking me with her. And there was a primary school called the Pupuma. Uh, and they'd just leave me there. I guess maybe she expected me to be babysat. Yeah. But then I just started studying. And because we were getting taught in Isuzulu, I understood things 
like I just my basic understanding of maths was always sound because I got it. I grasped it from the first time they taught us, you know. And I went to a school until grade four. And then I started going to like do nights primary, kings, yada yada yada. But my point here is this was a rural school. And the education that I got from there I think is invaluable. There's um the school is in Mpopo, I just forgot the name. Um for the longest time they'd literally be in the top hundred schools that perform well in the country. Yeah. Especially in maths and science. Yeah. But that has sort of like gone on the decline, which probably speaks to the way things were done in the nineties going to the two thousands, sort of like spoke to how you groomed a future whatever better than it is now. So then that means somewhere along the line, maybe when OBE was introduced, that's where we lost it. Well, I don't know if it's that. I'm an right? OBE kid. What are you trying it to say? It explains a lot. <laughs> that's funny. I mean, look, you, you have been unemployed for a year. <laughs> <laughs> you know? I'll tell you this. Um, I don't know if it's maybe the curriculum but everything exists within the system. So the teachers that are coming out now are teachers that came out in the system, right? Mm. So we what, 24 years into democracy? That's around about like the age that people start teaching. That yeah. guy who was born in 1994 is probably like a new teacher now or something, right? And so if we feel like the standard of education has decreased from that time, then the quality of teachers surely then will have decreased as well, right? And that's it's a ripple effect. Exactly. Yeah. And then you were going on to healthcare. Yes. So healthcare would be the next thing. And that's really just because you don't want people to die, right? We've got an issue here in South Africa where we've got all sorts of epidemics. So I tackle that secondarily. Then there's, I suppose, the issue of violence. But the violence, yes, it's a big issue. But I feel like maybe if you take care of the economy that would lessen. I'm not sure. It's not tested. But generally, I don't see people. I mean, there's, there's evidence and research that suggests that when the economy starts dipping, then crime and violence will obviously go up in a country. And when it goes up in a country, then generally it will affect women and the kids more, right? Because of the issues that we touched on earlier on. Yeah. So for me, then reason with states and dictate that if you fix the economy, then that should be okay as well. The economy, though, is a long-term thing. So if you fix education, as we've just spoken, it'll only come into effect 15, 20 years from now, yeah. right? And so that's when you're going to start seeing the results. Which of is that what the Chinese education. did. Yeah. yeah. So in essence... But uh, there, no, wait. Yeah. So there's still point okay. number four. Point number four is you've got to fix corruption. And the reason why you want to fix corruption is because there's already limited resources. And if those resources are leaking because, you know, people are siphoning funds, et cetera, and so on, that defeats the purpose. But also, you want to get the confidence of the public. So that if I come to you and I say, Len, I know you're paying 42% tax, but I need to increase the 60% tax. I'll be like, ah, okay, fine. At least I know you're not going to charge my money. Right? As I sit here, I can, afford to, I can afford to pay more tax. I wouldn't like to, but I can. The problem is, when we pay tax, you don't see the results. And so, you know, you fix corruption and you use that money wisely. And those are things. You had a question. Yeah, I wanted to go to the crime slash violence uh, and the economy. Mm -hmm. So we look at a place like Zimbabwe, for instance. Yeah. We know that the economy has been in shambles for the longest time. Yeah. And there's been... Since like, about 2001. Yeah. And there's been like riots and protests, left, right, and center, and all of that. But we, I don't know if it's because it's not that widely, widely reported that this is what's going on there and then what everybody knows? Or is it that when something happens in South Africa, for instance, we tend to make a mountain out of, an, out, out of something small? Well, you can't minimize issues. But there is a greater expectation for South Africa than other nations on the continent. That's a class thing when it comes to countries as well. It's not necessarily a class thing, but, um, man, a lot goes into making a country what it is. Geographical positioning is one, all right? True. 
Infrastructure is another. Leadership be the third. Uh, I've had the opportunity of traveling to most African countries through my work with MTV, etc. So and I've been doing it since I was 21 years old. Yeah, I first met you in Mozambique. Yeah. So some of, some of the biggest countries, like Nigeria, for example, which is currently Africa's biggest economy, is underdeveloped when it comes to infrastructure. Yeah. Right? Highly. Exactly. Um, and that doesn't really aid an economy to grow in any kind of way, right? We were fortunate as South Africans that we had that structure. I think the closest country to us when it comes to uh, infrastructure is Ghana. And Angola is coming up as well. Yeah. Angola. So but wasn't that as a result of, at some point, the country was forced to self-sustain? And hence, because when the... The, the word escapes me now. Um, the Afrikaners. When the Afrikaners were in charge and there were sanctions that yeah. were put uh, against oh, yeah. South Africa, yeah, yeah, yeah. it was a case of like, yo, you have to fend for yourself. And that fending for yourself sort of like pushed us to get our house in order because we could only survive if we get stuff done by ourselves. So... In turn, is it a case of those countries that were liberated before us sort of like were lax in getting their house in order versus us? No, it's not that they were lax. So you got to look at any oppressor, right? Uh, and this is why when Helen Zilla makes a point of the remnants of colonialism being good, it's kind of a disingenuous point. So any oppressor, when they come there and they develop a country, they're not doing it for the country. They're actually doing it for themselves, so, yeah. right? So if I come to Rhodesia, uh, and and uh, I think it's Ian Smith and I, and I build a railway line, for example, I'm building the railway line so that I can take the minerals that I'm going to pillage and, and thieve from, from, from that area and be able to transport them out of the country, right? Now, yes, the byproducts of that railway line is that people then get to transport themselves, yada, yada, yada. But the original idea was it was not for picture. good. Yeah. yeah, it wasn't for good. Yeah. Same thing in South Africa. If I come here and I build a mine, for example, it's because I'm trying to get to the gold. I'm not trying to boost your economy. <laughs> <laughs> you know? It then airport. just happens, yes. It then just it. happens yeah. that the byproducts of me building that mine is there will be towns that form yeah. around it. Tar People roads. get jobs, mm. tar roads, etc., and so on. Yeah. So we've always got to look at it in that context. Uh, let me mention Zimbabwe earlier. Regards with regards to Robert Mugabe. Yes. Do you think he was a hero or a villain? Uh, I don't think I can give you one or the other. So another thing that I've learned as I've grown older is that nuance is really, really important, right? If Robert Mugabe had died in 1999, hero, no doubt. Right? But obviously, he died in 2019 and is not a hero now. Uh, there was a time where Robert Mugabe was a prime example of good leadership in Africa. Some of the best educated Africans in the world. Was in Bobby. Yes. Mm. Um, and they were doing extremely well with the economy just on the strength of agriculture alone. Then he did something. Which was also a noble thought, but how it was executed was bad. He was like, guys, land reform. And then, you know, try to force his hand. Then they slapped him with sanctions. Then his people got set back. And now you've got the Zim that we have now. Would you say then, uh, just sort of like superimposing it to Cyril, the people around him sort of like threw him under the bus in a sense that they were like, yo, Land reform, maybe the way you're going about it is not a genius way of doing it. Let's sit back, look at it in a way that's going to benefit everybody as opposed to just going in, busting down doors and like, yo, we're here to take over. It's difficult to say with Cyril because we're still going through it, right? Cyril's story is far from being done. We don't really know what his advisors are telling him. We don't know what his plan is. What we do know is he spent the last three months going from frying pan into the fire. That's all we know, Yeah. right? In fact, I'd even go as far as saying this man has not been leading in any kind of way. He's just been mitigating risk. Once he gets down to the business of leadership, I hope that he's going to have a plan. And um, yeah, whether or not that plan works, we'll see. What's your stance on the land that everybody keeps talking about? There definitely needs to be land reform. 
There's no two ways about it. But how you go about it is the question, right? So you can't be in a situation where the minority is in possession of majority of the land. That's not sustainable. In a lot of ways, that's kind of like apartheid, right? But you also can't just go there and dispossess people of their land because that's also not sustainable. The world doesn't work that way. So you can be right, right? But still need to accommodate those that you think are wrong. And the reason why it has to be that way is because it's called a conflict of right. If I, as a native South African, feel like I'm entitled to land, and then you, Mac G, as a colonizer, come there and you fight me for the land and you dispossess me of the land, I feel like this land is rightfully mine, you got it illegitimately. You as Mac G feel like, dude, I fought you for the land, this land is mine. I got it legitimately, right? And so at that conflict, we both feel aggrieved. Whoever loses there, nobody's going to be happy about it. Mm. It's, it's like a, a yeah, a it's a philosophical discussion. Mm. And uh, it's like, a, it's called a tragedy. Yeah. Because at that point, whoever wins, somebody's rights is being impinged upon. Yeah. Based on how they view it. All right, let's and that's what leads to wars. Let's get to the good stuff. I'm about to fall asleep, guys. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Uh, what's your beef with uh, Vuso T- Tembekwayo? Vusi. Vusi in Tembekwayo, yeah. People always ask me that. I never beef with the guy. But um, maybe three, four years ago, mm-hmm. uh, when there was a huge taxi strike, I sent a few tweets just genuinely thinking, look, guys, because, you know, the taxi drivers, they've got their own financing situation, yeah. right? So when you go buy a taxi, the interest rate is high, bro. I think they get financed at like prime plus 10 or some dumb shit, right? <laughs> yeah, I think it's like 36%. And I was like, guys, those guys buy, if I remember correctly, uh, damn, like hundreds and hundreds of taxis every month, right? That's how much they contribute to the economy. And majority of those are like high aces or whatever. And then obviously, you know how much money they have just in terms of cash flow. Yeah. Right? So let's work on maybe 800 bucks to 1,000 rand a day per taxi. Look how many taxis we have in the country as a whole. That's a lot of guap. Yeah. And so I came up with the suggestion that I thought the guys should self-finance. Pool their money together, self-finance, self-insure, et cetera, and so on. And I, you know, I sent a series of tweets about that. This guy then took those tweets and went and made a video. <laughs> 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 he made a video. With all of those seeds, right? <laughs> and then, then I was like, oh, okay. Then I teased it. I was like, oh, this guy took my seat. You know? Yeah. yeah. Then the following day. Not that you can. Yeah. Then the following day, he kind of responded. <laughs> and for me, that's where I was like, oh, dude. Not only do you have the gall and the audacity to take my seats. And it's not even like, it's not a genius idea. I'm sure anybody else could have yeah. Like, not only do you have like the gall and the audacity to take my seats and present them as your own. But now you're actually defending this nonsense. <laughs> like, I'm the one who's a liar. So that's, that's when I went at him. So I guess that's where it originated. But it's not really a beef. I don't really care about the guy, to be quite honest. Have but, you guys met? Yeah. Okay. I even interviewed him. Okay. 702. But okay. I'll always call out nonsense. Okay. Because another thing about me is I, I'm not really scared, like, of anybody. You know? Yeah, yeah. So I'll call him out. Now, if you put even to his face, I'll tell him he's a punk. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then Forex? Same thing. So, I don't get involved in people's hustle. Yeah. Hustle, do your thing by all means. We all know Omar mm. Yeah. right? In the game. Mm. It's just that we don't expose him. Mm. But I really... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know. <laughs> oh, <laughs> But, Mac, I take great exception to people who take advantage of those who don't have. They're unfortunate. When you go out there and you take Imali Mpesheni from like an elderly person who's been saving up for heaven knows how long, right? I cannot accept that. Mm. That really irks me to know. It's inhumane, bro. Yes. And so that's why I expose those guys. But so, why do you think there's, 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 there's some sort of an attraction that a lot of people have? And there's this program that's on TV now. Uh, which, Forex Broker Killer. Yeah, that one. 
it's <laughs> every time I, I I would read like all the the the, the tweets that yeah. are, that go with the hashtag. Yeah. There are people who actually desire to live that lifestyle and they always want some like yo um how do i get into this like i also want to live that life type of thing how can people be that vulnerable i suppose with well let me ask you this do you want to be rich no 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 i want to be wealthy okay yeah and so then that's what people look at it as so they look at that as well then they go look man i want to get that but also you know, people like easy wins. Yeah. If, yeah. It's, if, yeah. if it seems like it's something I can do, then yeah, let's go out and do Anything it. Anything that's easy, exactly. everyone will do. Yeah. That's why everybody raps, you exactly. know? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, for real. He's right. <laughs> He's right. But what you were saying is, which is what I agree with you, Forex in itself is not a scam. Of course not. But people have turned it into a scam. Yeah, no, of course. I mean, how could it be? Forex is a legitimate financial instrument, right? But now you can't tell me that when there's people who literally have studied and have like masters in finance and even they can't master trading because you never really know, right? There's a lot of factors that go into it uh, to a point where you can even regard it as a gamble to some degree, right? Yeah. An educated gamble, but a gamble nonetheless. Now you're going to come and you tell me with your grade nine <laughs> and you're like, you're F in maths. You're going to tell me to teach? You're going to teach me how to, how to trade? Nah, bro. No. All right. If so, anything, that's irresponsible yeah. to encourage people to give you money like that. It doesn't make sense. Have you ever traded before? Have you yeah, tried it? Of course I have. And did you lose money, make money? Yeah, I've lost money. I've made money. Mac, let me tell you something. And this is... Yeah. Yeah. So as I was saying, I've got no issue with people trading their own money, investing with their own money. By all means, do your thing. I mean, I've... In terms of shares and like foreign exchange, I've probably put in maybe... $200,000 in various investments for yeah. whatever reason, you know? Mm, mm. And you win some, you lose some. That's great. Do you? Yeah. My problem is when you take people's money, Other people's, people's money. pension fund, mm. and then you you reckless with that. Who are none the wiser. You know? Yes, yeah, that's the problem. All right, so I got some questions from our chillers, ne? Yeah. Uh, Amukhelan mu a mugwane. Sorry, I'm going to butcher your guy's name. Sorry, OBE. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> How does he feel about being called named Google? Does that put some sort of pressure on him to continuously know, learn more because people are always ready to pick his brain? No, it doesn't put any pressure on me. Mm. Uh, <laughs> it's funny, though, because I was always this person, like, long before Twitter. Um, I always, like, try to read up on things that I think intrigue me. And then... And then I found that that information becomes useful somewhat. And so sometimes I'll share it. But it's a, it's, it's a weird thing, especially, I don't know if it's South Africa alone. Sometimes, if you share what it is that you think you know, people then take you as a know it all, right? And luckily for me, I never cared about it. Yeah. But all I'll do is I'll share the info, hoping that you share info back, and then I'll learn something, you know? yeah. Uh, but it makes for a good discussion. And the sort of person I am, especially on social media, is I'll interact with everybody. So yeah. generally, I think it works. Do you get a case where people ask you something they can literally Google in? All the time. <laughs> yeah, all the time. All the time. Uh, all right. Second question is, when you were still on YFM Season Scoop, this is pretty long, so bear with me. He once said he would never leave his monies and assets with a woman, but rather his sisters or mother, no matter how long they've been during um, dating or married. His argument was, I can't work hard alone for years, only to leave everything to someone I've known for two years. Uh, said his wife would be signing a prenup. Does he still stand by those words, or has he ha does he have a different view now? Because Scoop argued, clearly, you've never been in love. So, you got to look at it in context, right? When you were doing the season of Scoop show, we were literally like in our early 20s. Um, fucking loved it. It was fucking banging. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So, yes, when I get married, I'll still sign a prenuptial agreement, right? But I've got views about this. Mm. For me, the mother of my kids, my wife, is entitled to pretty much everything that I have, right? Uh, because if I love this woman enough to share my life with her, if I love this woman enough to have a kid with her, then surely everything I work for should be for her. Right, well, for the the family that I have, but 
but my family is broad. So my definition of family will also include my nieces, my sisters, mm. my mom, because it's for their well-being as well. Yeah. They also have had an input in me turning out to be the man that I am. 100%. Right? Um, if I've known you for two years, though, I mean, come on. You obviously not in the same <laughs> league. You're not in the same league as my mom and my sister. You still be entitled to whatever your bit is, right? Yeah, yeah. So if I've known you for two years and you, you're the mother of my kid, you're the mother of my kid. Yeah. That puts you in a different league. Yeah. But yeah, I can't just be giving what I've worked hard for dude, to somebody I met last night. No, that's not how it goes. Is that in the pipeline though, dude? Because you're getting old, man. What? Getting married? Yeah. And yeah, most kids. certainly. Yeah. yeah, most certainly. Um, I'm Yo, very... Imagine being Caesar's kid. Yo. <laughs> <laughs> You think I'd be a strict dad? <laughs> no, I'm thinking about the money, bro. That's money. <laughs> you smart and you've got money. Let me Damn. say something, guys. Hold on. Let me say something. You know, money isn't everything. Says people with but, money. <laughs> yeah, well, yes. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Um, yeah, you're right. I guess it takes having money to know that it isn't yeah. everything. Yeah. 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 Uh, Calvin says, um, who was the best MC on the YFM full clip? That birthed a lot of rappers, dude. The best ever? Yeah. Who you are putting me on the spot. Okay, top three. So here's the thing about MCs. You got to give me a criteria. Okay. So based on what? So when I just asked you that, what was the first name that came into your head? No, no. Give me a criteria. There's a lot of names that came to my head, but give me a criteria. Are you uh, talking about lyricist. the most successful? Oh, lyricist. Yeah. Gingerbread man. Ginger true. Yeah. Okay. Uh, successful? Uh, Questa. Swag. Although, Questa was already an MC by the time we started the show. He'd already been signed He had a name for himself, yeah. 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 Um, Swag. Yeah. Damn. Um, What's Swag? See, sometimes people can be swaggy the one moment. Actually, no, wait. I got to take that back. More successful is Casper. Casper was on the full, the full clip. Yeah. You get it. Yeah. I mean, again, now he also had a name, but we were the first people to play Casper's Gushesha song. Wow. Literally. Casper used to come there. He used to catch a taxi to come to our show. Shit. Yeah. That's deep, man. Uh, okay. Let's move on. Um, swag. Ah. I don't really know. Like, what's swag? I don't know. I just said that. <laughs> 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 That's funny. You used to do the show with uh, Scoop. How's your relationship with him? Are you guys still tight? Yeah, we're cool. We're not as tight as we used to be. We used to literally see each other and speak to each other every day. Mm. Now, I mean, the last time I spoke to him was I bought a farm and I went to go show him that one farm. Yeah. Uh, so that was the last time I hung out with him. Did you have mushrooms with him? No, no, no. I don't do those things. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, which MC are you feeling right now? And um, give, me, give me a top five. As well, while you're at it. I don't really have a top five. To be quite honest, you know, do you know what song I was listening to on the way here? What? Ariana Grande. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You still think we're nine more Side, side to <laughs> side. <laughs> you know? Um, I mean, I listen to hip hop every once in a while. Yeah. But, ah. You've never liked being boxed. Yeah. yeah. I listen to everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, literally, I, I mean, I like EDM. I like, I like everything. I listen to everything. But who are you fucking with right now? Like, Nasty? Nasty is obviously immensely talented. I do feel like Nasty makes better singles than he does albums. Nah. Yeah. Is there still You're room, right. Is there still room for albums, though? In there's, the... always, there's always room for albums. Shit, right? I never thought about that. He's actually right. Yeah, I, always, I think there's always room for albums. And I think a cohesive body of work is... It's always good. You know? Somebody who dropped a good album, funny enough, was El Tito. Which the one? last album that he dropped, uh, El Tito, was, 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 was pretty good. Which song did it have? Uh, damn, there's a lot of joints. Um, I can't remember what the title is of my favorite one now, uh, but there's a joint that he did that features Muggs. Oh. Um, I'll, look, I'll look up the title. Oh, you okay, know. cool. Angel Bungiwa says, ask him why he thinks the Sunday Papers labeled him as gay a few years ago. <laughs> I don't know why, but, you know, one thing you realize when you get to Joe Berg is that sometimes the tabloids, not the newspapers, the tabloids will just lie. Mm, um, just to sell. Yeah. 
But the beautiful thing about that and the lesson I took from it is that sometimes your reputation precedes you. So when people wrote that, the people that know me, in fact, even people that didn't know me just started defending me. So I didn't need to go out and defend myself at all. Yeah. Because the story was that I was gay, I was beating up my gay lover, and, <laughs> and, 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 and we got drunk, right? And we got drunk and we were fighting in Melville. <laughs> now, look at these things, right? <laughs> I don't, I don't mind being gay. Fine, that's cool. Let's say, let's say that's possible. Yeah. But I mean, what am I doing in Melville? Me. I was about in to Melville. I, I was about to say, like, the one thing that if you had to eliminate one thing there, yeah. it would be Melville, because. And then it, they said, oh, then they said I was drunk. I was oh, you don't. <laughs> no, they said they said my my my, my lover crashed my Nissan Duke. <laughs> like I drive a Nissan Duke. <laughs> So, uh, so that was hilarious. Oh, God. And initially, I was like, oh, man, what's going to happen? I was like, so I called them, and I was like, ah, I'm going to sue them. But when I called the editor, the editor was like very, very, very welcoming and very helpful towards me. <laughs> and they printed a retraction the following week. Dude, do they so, know your hit list, dog? <laughs> <laughs> He's got a crazy hit list, eh? <laughs> Just, yeah. just on just on 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 uh on the tabloids and whatnot and people writing nonsense yeah. uh in the space that you're in now one could argue that hey that was a- the birth of fake news <laughs> <laughs> um that's what kind of like where i'm going to now yeah do we still have any journalists left mm. yeah um there's a lot of very very sincere good and i think credible journalists out there uh, I mean, I work with some of the best colleagues, to be quite honest. You know, people like Okethi, Tulasiza Similane, uh, Karen Morn. Uh, I mean, I can't mention them all. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. But we, we, we've got some very credible people. And even other news stations. SABC's got some very credible people. E, e, ENCA. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you know, Tembile Mkototo. There's a lot of people, even that people we used to work with at EWN. Yeah. Right? Mm. So, yes, of course, there are plenty of good journalists. But then why is there so much, let me call it fluff journalism that happens in this country? Uh, every Sunday you, or every Monday you'll hear that a newspaper has to do a retraction because the story is this. The newspaper is being sued by this guy. And, and well, I don't know. I can't speak to that. But I suppose maybe everybody makes mistakes. I don't know. I think once. There's once a lot going on in the political world, right? Yeah. So there's a lot of misinformation that's going out there. There's a lot of stories that get retracted, sometimes not because they're not true, but because people can't prove their authenticity. Mm. There are certain things that I know, but that I can't just go speak about flagrantly because I can't prove them. Yeah. And so then to err on the side of caution, I don't want to defame somebody. And then when they take me to court, I'm left holding my hands, right? Yeah. So sometimes it's that. Uh, Pilar Sunday Makasa says, what's the chat with his farm? Like, what does he farm on it? And also, what advice would you give to the ordinary individuals when it comes to financing a farm? <clears throat> um, so I've actually got a few farms. It's more than one. Hey, hey, no. Hey, no. Um, <laughs> uh, I've got cattle. I've got forests. Um, we're going to do some crops now. Yeah. Um, and I've been fortunate, man. I've, I've I've been in business from like 21 or whatever, you know? Yeah. And in all that time, I always had a steady job as well and a steady income. So I never really needed to draw anything from my businesses. So all the money that I've amassed, I've just always been able to reinvest, et cetera, and so on. He's one of those guys that forget to invoice when we're busy invoicing <laughs> <laughs> the station. You know? <laughs> so, um... But never go into business for any other reason than to to make money. And the only way you can make money in a business is if you understand it. Mm. So just because farming seems to be the in thing, don't go into it now. Mm. But if you know farming, then yes, definitely go into it. Yeah. Just like in any other thing. Yes. Yeah. No, you're right. Uh, how was it being bent into the hottest sugar mama, Azania Musaka? She's my crush, by the way. That's, That's funny. Who Siripa, said that? It's Siripa Maba, Maba Bolo. Mama Bolo. Uh, I was never been sent to anybody. <laughs> 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 were you guys dating? Nope. You weren't, eh? This was at 702, because I saw you guys. You were pretty close. 
Yeah, yeah, we were very close. We were friends. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, which other? I heard you dated the, the Indian lady, Naidu something. Is that she Naidu? Yeah. Yes, I did. Hey, my nigga. <laughs> <laughs> She's a great woman, great lady, man. Oh, my goodness. Can I throw out some more names? You can confirm or deny. So, you know why I don't want to do that? Okay. Because it's disrespectful to the women. Uh, that's something 50 Cent would say. A man doesn't kiss and tell. Yeah. <laughs> that's the only reason why I wouldn't do that. Yeah, yeah. Um, the session I do, I could confirm because, like, you know, that's in the public domain. Yeah. Um, Are you dating right now? I am. Is it? Yeah. You don't want to disclose? Oh, of course not. Okay. All right. Mm. But I'm very happy. Nah. Yeah. Baby's coming soon. Has she signed the prenup? I only, <laughs> I only have a baby once we get married. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. How old are you now, sis? I am 36 this year. Oh, he's still young, bro. Yeah. All right, cool. Ma- Mandy Laka says, has he ever been broke or lost at all since winning the MTV base gig? If not, how has he kept it going for more than 10 years in the game without falling off? What setbacks has he faced? What mistakes has he made since getting into the game? So define broke. Me. <laughs> <laughs> no. So you still cool, right? So let me let me yeah, broke this is relative. Yeah. Yeah. I've never not been able to pay a bill. I've never like missed a bill in my life. Okay. Right? Um have I had tough times in business? Yes, of course. You're kidding, sir. Yeah, of course. Dude, I've closed down businesses. Sold the capello. businesses. No, no, that I sold. Okay. Yeah, it's like I've sold businesses. Um, sometimes you start something, it doesn't really work out, and you're like, ah. So, for example, I had a butchery in Yeovil. And also, like, I bought a cash. And the thing used to make money for us, yada, 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 you know? I was still working with Wyatt at the time. Mm. And then, and the rent was, like, fairly low. Okay. Uh, it was literally on courts and banquets. Okay. Right? Heavy traffic, let's do manja. Yeah. Um, and then for some reason, after like two years, I was like, ah, let me move it. Right? The lease was up. I was like, let me move it around, just around the corner. We moved it over there. Literally, business died. Wow. We went to close. You know? Yes. So, How much did you lose there? Nah, I didn't lose anything. I'd already made my money back and some. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But the business closed. And so and a revenue stream stopped. Mm. Um, I've been in investment, for example. So, <laughs> so um, even Forex, right? Yeah, yeah. So I had a position on the dollar. And I'm not like a spot trader. So I'll take a position and I'll hold it for like long term, right? And the markets close on weekends. So like on Friday evening, I think at like 11 p.m. they'll close. Then they'll open again on Sunday morning, like, yeah, or whatever. Um, so I had a position, or well, Sunday evening. So I had a position that was held, and then a hurricane happened in the U.S. <laughs> <laughs> over the weekend, right? <laughs> so a hurricane over, happened. Was it Katrina? No, it wasn't Katrina. Oh. I can't remember which one it was. <laughs> and it was coming on CNN, and then when the markets opened, <laughs> I was down like $20,000 or something. <laughs> That's crazy. And it hurts. Yeah. And it wasn't like a realized loss because you only realize the loss when you close the position. Yeah. But, you know, so I've had things like that. Where do you get that, man, from your inter... What's it? Entrepreneurship. Is that from a young age, your parents? Uh, I don't know where I get it from. Like, I'm, I'm brave, I suppose. Mm, mm. Um, high risk, high reward. Yeah. But also... I can always, I'm, I'm, I'm able to see an opportunity to make money. Got you. Yeah. So I'm also lucky. That's another thing. Like, I'm just extremely lucky. Yeah. I remember when you started DJing, I'm like, oh, are so you DJ now? Yeah. Like, yeah, of course, why not? I'm charging 20K. <laughs> <laughs> you see, and that's another thing. So when we started in Y, because uh, when you're on radio, people just assume you can DJ, right? <laughs> So they'd call the office, they'd call the office literally every day, like, yo, can we book Caesar? And I was like, I don't DJ, I don't DJ, I don't DJ. I did this for a year, and then I was like, you know what, I'm going to learn how to DJ. So I announced in 2009 that I'm going to DJ. Literally, I put it out on Twitter, yeah. and then I had a booking that week. The next weekend, I had a booking. Yeah. And Mac will tell you, I was booked out my ears, dog. Dude, And dude. DJ money is some of the great, greatest money. People don't tell you. There's a lot of money to be made there. Yeah, it is. 
And it's easy, man, because yeah. you're having fun at the same time. Straight up. And I'm playing other people's songs. I don't perform that. It's easy. I was like, this is light work. <laughs> Uh, Maktawe MCV says, please ask him why he doesn't change his profile picture. Um, it's never, I never really thought about it. It wasn't a big deal. Like, how I ended up on Twitter, a friend of mine opened the account for me, Swade, right? I'm like, yo. Then he opened the account, 2009, like, whatever. And I just didn't bother to change it. But then when I realized that it became a thing, <laughs> then I stopped, right? <laughs> so then... When I was throwing, because I used to throw parties, yeah, yeah, yeah. school parties, whatever, my own parties, once the season school thing ended, I, I actually, like a brand offered me money to sponsor my birthdays. Like, you remember they used to do that? Yeah, like, yeah. You used to pay at all of them. Yeah. And whenever I changed my profile picture, the thing would trend. <laughs> I was like, yo, this thing is like great marketing, bro. <laughs> so I was like, yo, if you offer me guap, I will change my profile pic to be the flyer. <laughs> like, Ciroc offered me like 250,000 bucks. <laughs> In the following year, uh, oh, another man. alcohol brand, I can't remember who it was, offered me guap, like yeah. 300,000, man. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So, if you had to change the podcast in jail, we out of here. Well, I, I hope so. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is... yeah. All right, here's the last question. John yeah. Neem Tali says, why is it better to buy a plot than an apartment? And given the recent um, spade of xenophobic attack attacks, the rating agency will downgrade us from a positive outlook to subpar investment grade. Yeah. What effects will that have on the future property investment? So it's not. It's, to say it's better to buy a plot than an apartment is not necessarily a complete statement. Yeah. I said that to Euphonic yesterday because of where I am in life. Okay. I've got apartments. Yeah. Right? Plenty of apartments. So I don't need any more apartments. I'm in a stage in my life where I can buy a plot. Yeah, give me one. I'm homeless now, bro. I can't give it to you. <laughs> 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 but also, my, my apartments are all occupied. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. uh, But it depends at which stage you are in your investment life, mm. right? For me, the reason why I decided to buy a plot, for example, when I bought my first one, I was looking for a house. Um, and I was like, in the Bryson area. And you know, and like, the prices are like going up to like 15, 16 million now, you know? I'm yeah. like, how, oh, guys, 16 million? Then something in me just told me, yo, type in farm and see what you find. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? Then I typed in the farm and then I found one that I liked. Uh, and then that was kind of it. Are your farms in KZN, eh? One in KZN. Uh, one here in Johannesburg. Oh, there's one in Johannesburg. Yeah, oh, and nice. then one in Limpopo. Oh, yeah. Mm. That's dope, man. We've got some nice soil in Limpopo. Hell, yeah. <laughs> um, so... I saw you with Trevor Noah the other day, man. How's he doing, man? You guys were together, didn't you? Yeah, yeah. He's doing immensely well. Uh, he's cool, man. He's doing his thing. Yeah. Yeah. How did you meet him? Ah, we've always known each other since they're like 21. I met him at Urban Brew. Oh. Yeah. Just doing the whole TV thing together. Yeah. And so, yeah, we just became friends. And how are you finding things at Newsroom? Your promos are funny, eh? <laughs> <laughs> Not in a good way. <laughs> it's a cringe fest. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> so, um, things are going well at Newsroom. Yeah. I'm generally happy. I think the channel's been off to a better start than um, than we even hoped. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The promos. So, like, some of the ones that she's talking about, like the Matrix one. Yeah, right? the Matrix, dude. I'm we like, like, what the hell's going yeah. on here? It's just, we, we just mess around sometimes. <laughs> and we do things out of the one <laughs> And you know me, like I like I like being silly. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah, yeah. So and we know, like we knew, especially when we were starting out, that the word would get out. So yeah. Like, like, Yo, yeah. What are these guys doing? <laughs> you know. So that's essentially it. And I hear you say hi to Tavila for me, eh? I will. Uh, why aren't you on WhatsApp, dude? Just cause I don't want to be. Nah, you like the only person I know who's not on WhatsApp. It's so weird. Yeah, nah, I don't want to be. Yeah, um, a lot of people might think that you know, like you blow your own horn. Do you think that's a misunderstanding? It depends. Um, I don't think it's a misunderstanding. I don't. I don't think I'm neither here nor there about it. Yeah. If it's what you think, it's probably true. Yeah. Uh, if it's not what you think, I'm also fine with that. Yeah. But I always tell people this: like I'm extremely blessed in life. I don't deserve half the things that I have. Right. Got you. So I'm certainly not gonna now not celebrate my life and my joys. Just to make people feel comfortable. Mm. It doesn't work that way. Yeah. 
So, yeah. And you're not being pompous in any kind of way. No, I don't know. I mean, I'll try not to be. Yeah. Um, I'm also, like, I joke around a lot. So sometimes I'll be messing around with things, you know? Yeah. Um, and yeah. Dude, be, yeah. ever since I've known you, dude, I've never seen you mad. Like, do you ever take things too hard, bruh? Because, like, you know, in this day and age, yeah. there's so many trolls, and you always on social media, like, all day, every day, you know? Yeah, I mean, sometimes I get mad. Nothing on social media, though, will get me mad, mm. you know? Uh, uh, there's serious things in life, man. For real? And so social media is not a serious thing in my life. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, I'll, I'll mess with it. But, yeah, I suppose I can get mad. Yeah. Hmm. You've been mad? Yeah. Last time you met, what happened? No, nothing happened. I got mad and I resolved it. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, yeah, yeah. that was it. Are you close to Kanye Long? Yeah, that's my cousin. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. Oh, okay, cool. I always wondered. I never knew until like recently. Someone yeah, told yeah. me. In fact, was... I was a page boy at her first wedding. Ah. Yeah. ah. Dude, sees. thanks for coming, bro. I mean. Pleasure, pleasure, pleasure. And you were saying these things are too long. So how long should it be, the, the interview? You know, people don't want to concentrate and sit there and watch somebody for like longer than forty five minutes. I don't think you reckon. Over keep it at forty five. Yeah, but sometimes the the conversations are so intriguing. Like I just want to keep on going. It's a live conversation. Just stop it, and then people can guess about the rest. Ah, gotcha. But there's one thing I gotta tell you, man. Like you've always been like a brother to me, and a brother I never had. You know, Mm. I remember when I got fired at Y. There were two people that called me. Um, The other guy I don't want to talk about him that much. And you were the other guy that called me. And, you know, I was sitting there like, fuck. I was confused, lost. I didn't know what the fuck was going on, you know. And then you were like, yo, dude, what happened? I'm like, yo, sis, I fucked up, man, you know. And you're like, yo, dude, keep your head up. You know, you're like, dude, you're talented. Don't worry, something's going to come along. And I don't know if I've ever told you this, but shit, man, that helped, bro. Thank you, Mac. Um, I appreciate it, man. You know, generally, the personal relationships I have with people, I, I try and protect. So you telling that story is great. I'd personally never go out there and tell people yeah, about that. Yeah. You know, and I try and do that with various different people. One day, maybe when I die, and people have a memorial, you know how people speak about, yo, so so help me out like this. <laughs> you know, but yeah. that's for me, that's where... The genuine relationships stand, and uh, and I appreciate it, and uh, and I'm glad if I was able to help, uh, because for me, you've also always been a genuine dude as well. I miss a genuine energy, nah. right? So if the energy is genuine, I'll reciprocate it. If you fake, that's cool. I mean, do your thing. But yeah. yeah, I remember you had my back so many times in nine four seven. That's funny. Oh man, that's crazy. <laughs> I still got your back even now. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, thanks a lot, sis, man. Sis, uh, when are you in the newsroom, bro? Uh, weekdays, mornings, uh, 6 to 9 a.m. All right. And then we're going to see if he's going to change his uh, Twitter handle to podcast in jail. We will see. <laughs> you guys got the 300K? <laughs> <laughs> Are you moving and worried about your furniture getting damaged while doing it? Don't despair. L&M Removals is here for you. At L&M Removals, we assist you with a move, whether you're an individual or a corporate entity. We know the stress of moving and we are here to assist you with office furniture removals, household removals, or storage facilities. We are the most reliable and efficient furniture removal services company. We deliver on time, professionally, and with zero damages. For a quotation, get in touch now. L&M, make the best move. Podcast and chill. Matt G, the Ghost Lady, and Lynn Moleko.